Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed From Dust Till Dawn, uh, 1996. I really like From Dust Till Dawn. I like it a lot. Uh, I think it's a great vampire movie, a great action movie. Um, one of my favorite Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino movies. So uh, there's a lot of good things about From Dust Till Dawn that are worth talking about relative to films in general and this class particularly for vampire films. So I actually saw From Dust Till Dawn uh, when I was a freshman in college. A um, bunch of friends of mine uh, and I got in a car and we went to the theater. Uh, this would have been roughly spring 1996, so the second semester of our freshman year. Uh, in case you were curious, uh, this is what I looked like in 1996. That's me right there. Uh, we were apparently dressed for a Halloween party. Uh, one of my friends is a lumberjack, one of my friends is a flapper, and I'm not really sure what I was. Uh, I certainly had more hair back then. I don't think that was part of my costume. Um, I also was, uh, as a after I got out of braces, I used to grind my teeth, and so I always have an appreciation for the, uh, the retainer scene. So it's nostalgic for me, both my memory of going to see the movie and the teeth grinding. So when we went to see this movie in the theater, um, we went to see it because it was a Robert Rodriguez movie, a Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, we had some familiarity in 1996 with both of those directors. So Robert Rodriguez was best known for El Mariachi and Desperado at that time. Uh, those are two movies in a series of three. The third is Once Upon a Time in Mexico, which is also a very good movie, but that would have come uh, after From Dust Till Dawn, so we wouldn't have known about it back then. And of course, Quentin Tarantino, we knew for Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So these were kind of our... Uh, our expectations going into this movie was we were going to see an action movie. It was going to be a fair amount of violence. Uh, it was going to be somewhat humorous, possibly. So uh, th that was what we went to the theater, and that's what we were looking for. I don't think we saw a lot of publicity surrounding this movie. And despite the fact that I know there are trailers for it, I don't ever remember seeing uh, a trailer. I just remember seeing this was looked like an interesting movie, and we were going to go see it which is pretty remarkable because the vampire, the first vampire appearance in this movie comes at one hour and one minute. And in a movie that's an hour and 47 minutes, that's fairly remarkable. So there you see our, our first vampire, pretty graphic, uh, monstrous vampire. But uh, that's, that's over a full hour into the movie. So before that, it was a very different movie. And we were fairly shocked when it became a vampire movie. And, and that experience was not unique. I've talked to a lot of people uh, that saw this movie in the theater and, and really weren't prepared for a vampire movie. I can't say we were as shocked as the people in the movie because they were being attacked by vampires, but we were still fairly surprised and still enjoyed the movie, but definitely we were not prepared for a vampire movie. So uh, this particular movie I think is important because it is another vampire western, uh, not unlike Near Dark. So we know it's a western because we have... Uh, the setting is set in Texas. Um, this is a very Western locale in this particular shot. You can see the mountains and the desert and that kind of Western feel. So that's certainly one way that it signals that it's a Western. And then one other element of the Western uh, that we saw in Near Dark, and you would see if you saw lots of other Western films, is this kind of last stand, uh, this shootout at the OK Corral or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where you're up against, in this case, you're up against vampires and near dark, you're up against law enforcement, but you know, you're kind of stockpiling your weapons and shooting your way out. And that, that's what they're doing in, uh, in this scene. So that, for me, also makes it uh, a Western. Westerns also often have a sheriff. Um, this particular sheriff in this film, uh, we have Michael Parks, who plays Earl McGraw, and you can see him there. Uh, he may look familiar to you, uh, whether it's Michael Parks or just the name Earl McGraw. If you go to the Internet Movie Database and you look up this film and you see Michael Parks' entry as Earl McGraw, and you don't click on Michael Parks, because if you click on Michael Parks, you'll get the list of films that he's been in, but you click on Earl McGraw, you'll get all the times that Earl McGraw appears in film, that name. And what's really uh, funny to me is this is what you get when you do that. And you can see that Michael Parks has played Earl McGraw several times in various movies. Now, all of these movies are either associated with Quentin Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez, so there's no accident there. It's not a coincidence. 
uh, it's kind of an inside joke between uh, Tarantino and, and Rodriguez and Michael Park. So you might have recognized him from uh, The Grind Grindhouse, which was that uh, movie I've referred to in the past that uh, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez did together. It's a very long movie, and it's actually two movies broken up, Death Proof and Planet Terror. And he is, uh, he's Earl McGraw in both of those movies. He's also Earl McGraw in the Kill Bill movies. And if you've ever seen those movies, that's, uh, that's Michael Parks from the Kill Bill movies. So uh, it looks exactly the same. It's literally the same character uh, by name um, and outfit and persona. Uh, so it's just funny to me. You'll see that there's a From Dust Till Dawn, the series. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Michael Parks is not Earl McGraw on that. That's Don Johnson, if you've ever, if you have any familiarity with Don Johnson from his Miami Vice days. Um, that's, that's who's Earl McGraw in the series From Dust Till Dawn. So as I mentioned, um, From Dust Till Dawn was also a TV series. You can see it there on the right. Um, started in 2014. Um, but it also spawned two movies, uh, sequels, that were essentially straight-to-video kinds of releases. Uh, neither one is very good. Neither one is really worth watching. Uh, but uh, you'll notice on both of those covers that they still uh, try to associate themselves with Tarantino and Rodriguez, which is pretty funny because they really didn't play any role in these two movies other than inspiring the first one. They didn't direct it. Um, but again, uh, still uh, still a way to sell a movie, right? You put Tarantino and Rodriguez on the top and it doesn't really matter how bad it is. People will uh, buy it in any way. So they weren't particularly popular or particularly well done. So there are a couple of uh, jokes I want to point out in From Dust Till Dawn, and not necessarily like kind of ha-ha funny jokes, but really uh, jokes that are supposed to uh, resonate with the audience. So the first one I wanted to point out is uh, the appearance of Fred Williamson. You may remember that I mentioned Fred Williamson when we talked about Blackula. Uh, Fred Williamson is a very famous black exploitation actor, a very famous actor, but he made his name in black exploitation films. And this character in this movie is very much like uh, the Fred Williamson characters from his famous black exploitation films. Quentin Tarantino, who wrote this film, would have been aware of that because he loves black exploitation films so much. So that's kind of putting him in there and playing that role is very much a you're supposed to get it that it's that that's his black exploitation persona, the cigar, the whole thing. If you if you're ever interested, go back and watch some old Fred Williamson black exploitation movies, and you'll see very much uh, this character. The other kind of inside joke that I think is worth pointing out is the Cheech Marin joke of this movie. So Cheech Marin of Cheech and Chong, you might be familiar with uh, the comedy duo of Cheech and Chong. So Cheech Marin appears several times in this movie, uh, not uh, as the same character. He plays multiple characters in this movie. So you see him initially as uh, the border crossing guard, and then we see him as this kind of carnival barker guy. Uh, it's really kind of lewd, crude, carnival, uh, the guy standing outside the bar. Um, and then you see him at the very end of the movie when they come to meet them at the at the bar after it gets blown up. So uh, that's supposed to be a joke that you as the audience are supposed to get and be amused by, that you keep seeing Cheech Marin again and again. Uh, it's not as though there were two other actors that didn't make the cut and they just replaced them with Cheech Marin. It's a joke, and I, I find it humorous. Um, and I, I think Rodriguez and Tarantino want their audiences to kind of laugh as Cheech Marin keeps popping up again and again. Uh, the music of From Dust Till Dawn, I really enjoy. It's, uh, it's very much got that Western motif to it. It's kind of rock and roll, uh, kind of uh, rockabilly music, if you're familiar with that genre. I'm almost certain that I own the soundtrack to From Dust Till Dawn on CD somewhere in my house. I have a box of CDs that I seem to be moving from location to location and never unpacking. And my wife wants me to throw them out, but I can't really part with uh, my CD collection of hundreds of CDs that I'll never listen to ever again. Uh, but uh, the music in From Dust Till Dawn would be a, is a combination of diegetic and non-diegetic music. So some of the music is part of the narrative and some of the music is essentially just background music. Um, you can see uh, the band in the bar. They are, I really, they're pretty well done. I really like their music. Uh, I enjoy when they walk into the bar and the band is playing. Like that, that's, uh, it's good music. And it's music that they hear and music that we as the audience hear. 
uh, if you, I'm sure you noticed, but not only are they a band that's playing in the bar, but they are also vampires um, and become vampires when, when everything goes to hell, for lack of a better term. Um, and if you didn't notice when they were playing after they became vampires, that's supposed to be a corpse that they're playing there. So that still shot gives you a better angle on that. Uh, the name of the band, uh, Tito and Tarantula, they are an actual band. Uh, they featured Robert Rodriguez and the Oingo Boingo drummer, uh, Johnny Hernandez. But they're a real band. You can, you can listen to some of their music. Not incredibly popular, but definitely a band. So as uh, this is a vampire movie, it has to have this kind of standard vampire trademarks. So we have bats, which is uh, pretty normal in a vamp vampire movie. And of course, all these bats come in and turn into actual vampires that walk around, which is part of the problem. Uh, we see the cross that Kate is wearing uh, early in the movie, before we even know this is going to be a vampire movie. And that cross ends up being a weapon. So the cross as weapon uh, is another motif that pops up again. We see the kind of upside down vampire hanging. Um, the vampires in this film are pretty monstrous. They're not kind of everyday walking around normal looking vampires, except before they turn into vampires. But once they become vampires, uh, they're pretty much just monsters. We can see here that um, sunlight or light in general uh, harms these vampires and that's how they kind of survive at the end. So that's a, a vampire motif that uh, continues and, and will continue in some of our other movies. Uh, I do uh, enjoy the reference to the cut hand because again, uh, that is a, a not only a trope that pops up in vampire movies left and right, but it really is, um, it's intentional there you know it's the most graphic cut hand of the cut hands that we've seen so far but ultimately the, the kind of wound that sets the vampires off is something that pops up again and again in these movies so i think that's an intentional nod to dracula and nosferatu and and that uh that history of vampire movies and then of course the vampire transformation uh, that we see Sex Machine go through where he develops fangs and his hands turn into kind of claws. Uh, that's, again, part of the, the vampire mythology of what, what humans become when they become vampires. Uh, I would point out that uh, much of this movie, the kind of comic elements of this movie, don't really begin until it becomes a vampire movie. Uh, the first half, or, or really more than half of this movie, is not all that funny. It's kind of dark, and uh, there's not a whole lot of opportunities to laugh. And yet, when they become, or when it becomes a vampire movie, uh, then humor seems to be interjected. It also becomes very self-conscious when it becomes uh, a vampire movie, self-reflexive, as we've used in, to describe some of our other movies. You know, they're kind of standing around trying to figure out what it is that hurts vampires, and they're listing all the things, and they're arguing about silver. Um, and at one point, uh, Jacob says, you know, is this stuff that we actually know about vampires, or is this stuff that we learned from vampire movies? And in a movie about vampires, talking about vampire movies, that's very self-reflexive and, and intentional. So that's worth noting as well. Uh, there are a couple of variations on the, the vampire myth that pop up in here that I think are worth talking about, and a couple of them are really just jokes. So we know that vampires die by getting you know a stake driven through their heart. In this particular scene, the vampires are brought to the stake as opposed to the stake <clears throat> being brought to the vampires. So I always get a, get a little laugh when he... Uh, impales the three the four uh, vampires with the legs of the table which is what you're seeing there um, again we see the cross as a weapon but in this particular case part of the cross is a shotgun so not only is the cross itself a weapon but there's a weapon in the weapon so that there's there's kind of a, a joke there about the power of the cross um, when we see this their Winnebago I always am struck by how similar it is to the Winnebago uh, or at least motorhome uh, that was in near dark. I mean, it looks almost identical to me, except for the fact that the windows aren't blacked out. Uh, I can't tell you whether Rodriguez and Tarantino are making a direct reference to near dark by using that, uh, but I'd like to think that they are, and it certainly resonates with me. And both of both Rodriguez and Tarantino would have known near dark as a film. Uh, when Kate 
is conflicted about staking the vampire uh, that, that looks just kind of like a guy that's asleep and then when he wakes up as a vampire she really jabs it in and um, and Sex Machine looks over at her to see what she's doing and she's kind of given that I'm okay after just jamming a stake in a vampire's heart. Um, I kind of laugh a little bit at that and of course that's the moment when Sex Machine gets bit when he's distracted looking over um, at Kate. So uh, I think it's both a joke and both telling about you know where she is in the story, right? That she is overcome her fear and and is now a vampire killer if you will and then one of the biggest changes is the vampire's origins so up until this point we've thought of vampires as kind of this eastern european uh in origin and what this uh what this ruin is supposed to suggest is that these vampires are not eastern european in origin uh, they might have some some Spanish roots in them, and they may have some South American and Latin American roots in them. But ultimately, these are different kinds of vampires. And also, what you're looking at there, I'm fairly confident, is a matte painting. You know, that's not a real set. That didn't really exist. So when we talk about uh, setting and how to uh, how to widen what you're you don't have to build a set if you want to have something like this you just have a matte painting and you film it as if it were a set uh, prince talks about horror movies in chapters five and seven so he talks about them in chapter five relative to editing and chapter seven as part of his discussion of genre so for prince um in terms of mood and tempo uh one of the ways in which uh you can work uh, with mood and tempo for Prince is using editing techniques and what he says in horror movies is they use cuts you know so when the scene kind of ends and you cut to something else um, that that creates a fair amount of suspense and shock uh, he also suggests that when you have a tight close-up on someone that prevents viewers from seeing uh, other people in the room or other things in the room and you can think of in horror films uh, the young teenager, you know, walking to check something in the basement. It's usually tight on that teenager as they, he or she walks into the basement and then is, you know, inevitably murdered by some horror villain. Uh, we know from the films that we've watched that horror films can be traced all the way back to the silent period. So we saw Nosferatu, but uh, there are always other examples. Uh, what horror films do, we've talked about this a little bit, is they threaten what we think of as normal. Um, so whatever it is that the narratives position as normal, uh, normal families, normal people, uh, normal abilities, those are changed in horror. And they're often made, you know, horrific. They're made supernatural. Sometimes they're the kind of thing you can't quite put your finger on. Um, and that's part of what makes horror films scary is they threaten what we think we know is normal. Uh, Monsters also threaten uh, what we the ways in which we classify things. So we classify things by using boundaries. And what Prince says is that monsters undercut boundaries. So if you think of a set of boundaries between normal and abnormal, or human and animal, and living and dead, monsters don't play within those boundaries, and that that threatens us psychologically. And also, you know. Uh, there are more modern horror movies and there are sort of more older traditional horror movies. And for Prince, the modern horror movie, certainly due to special effects, leaves a great deal less to the imagination. So if you think of um, From Dust Till Dawn as a horror movie and you think of the original Dracula from the 30s as a horror movie, they are very different in terms of what they leave to the imagination. And uh, the modern horror movie doesn't really end on a kind of happy note, if you will, or at least a note that suggests everything is okay. So this particular one, uh, you know, Kate's whole family is dead and uh, and he tells her, you know, go home, whatever that means, hands her a bunch of money and here she's in this kind of blood covered shirt in the middle of Mexico. Uh, that's not very comforting. And if you, you can think of a bunch of horror movies that end on that kind of ambiguous, awful note. So Prince says that's a characteristic of modern horror movies. If you're at all familiar with a strain of literature on uh, teen slasher films, uh, someone named Carol Clover came up with a term called the final girl. Uh, and Kate is very much a final girl in this movie. So the final girl survives to the end um, while everyone else dies. She's often 
more pure than the people who uh, die. So if you think of teen slasher movies, and that's what Carol Clover was talking about, you know, there's usually a group of teenagers and several of them are having sex or doing drugs or drinking, and they're the ones that the the monster, whether it's Jason or Michael Myers or whomever, uh, kill. Uh, the one that survives is like the babysitter or the school teacher, or the one that's doing good things, the final girl. Um, and we see that in Kate a little bit. And just to clarify, uh, Clover is talking about movies like Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. And I included the dates uh, to give you a sense of the time period that Clover is talking about. She was, she's not talking about the reboots of any of these movies. She was talking about the originals. So in the article that we read by Higgins, um, Higgins is pretty centrally concerned with the critique of action films. Um, it's hard to argue that From Dust Till Dawn is not an action film, so it's very much an action film. But what Higgins says is that action films are popular, but they're also criticized as kind of devoid of narrative, not, not having a lot of story to them, that they're all about action. And um, what Higgins says is action films are different than classical narratives, but they're not non-narrative. And I know that's a double negative, but what he's saying is that they still have a story and they still have a story that's compelling. It just happens to be structured around what he calls visually sensational elements. So the narrative elements that are most important in action films are often very visual. Um, he also says that, that the situations that generate suspense in action films are those that involve physical danger. So they're not really about emotion or thought or feeling in the same way um, that a more dramatic movie would be. But there's, they still have narrative moments that generate suspense, but they involve um, usually some kind of um, harm coming to one of the major characters. Um, he gives an example from the movie Speed, if you've seen Speed, about uh, action films being built around combining variations on a single situation. So you want to go back and read uh, what he says about Speed. Speed, of course, uh, was for its time a very entertaining film, um, probably one of Keanu Reeves' best films, though I don't know what that means given that Keanu Reeves is not a particularly good actor. He's someone that plays the same role all the time and none of them seem appropriate. So if you've ever seen him in Speed, he's really not all that different than he is in Dracula, um, which is kind of kind of his gig. So, um, but read up on what Higgins says about Speed and also read up about what Higgins says about the three act structure of the action film. Uh, those three acts are setup, complication, and climax. So we already talked about how Nosferatu is intentionally set up in acts. I mean, it actually calls them out. But what he's suggesting is that these three acts are uh, implicit as opposed to explicit in, in action films. And I would read what he says about uh, the act structure of the action film. So what are the key takeaways from, uh, from Dust Till Dawn? Well, uh, from Dust Till Dawn is another one of our vampire westerns, so that's worth noting, and we've seen what elements make it a western and what elements make it a vampire film. Uh, it is both a traditional horror film and it has that kind of new horror that Prince is talking about. So it's important to know what elements uh, sort of subscribe to the horror playbook and which other ones sort of break from that. Uh, it's important to remember that action and narrative are not mutually exclusive. So when you say something's not mutually exclusive, you mean those two elements are not always separate. They're not always distinct. And action and narrative can go together uh, and, and can play on each other. And for a movie that is mostly narrative in the first hour and then becomes action in the last 47 minutes, that's, that's why action and narrative don't always, it's a good example of why action and narrative don't always have to be separated. And I want to leave you with this uh, for fans of zombie cinema, whether it's uh, the television show Near Dark or any of the Dawn of the Dead movies or Night, Night of the Living Dead. For me, these vampires kind of blur the distinction between vampires and zombies. They behave a little bit like zombies. So, you know, we know that you get bit by a vampire, you become a vampire. Um, here, it seems a lot quicker 
um, you know, in our previous films, vampires kind of linger a little bit. Uh, you bite them, and then over time, they slowly become sicker and sicker, and then uh, become vampires. But in this film, um, they seem to become vampires right away, and they're kind of a horde. You know, if you've ever read any of the literature on vampires in popular culture and zombies in popular culture, uh, zombies are kind of mindless hordes. They're not... They don't really have a culture. They don't seem to really have much of a thought. Uh, they just kind of wander in the direction of something that they can eat. And then they eat that thing, and that thing also becomes a zombie. We see an element of that here, um, though we also see vampires that can think and feel and um, and are way more conscious. So anyway, when I see them, uh, when I see that kind of horde, I often think of zombies, even though this is very much a vampire film and very much not a zombie film.